Released by Square Enix in 2020 on the PlayStation 4, Final Fantasy VII Remake would be the first installment in a new trilogy. Directed by Tetsuya Nomura and written by Kazushige Nojima, the game would be an action RPG expanding upon the events of the original 1997 title. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, we see the industrial city of Midgar built up and maintained by the Shinra Electric Power Company. One night, one of the reactors powering the city, called a Mako Reactor, is infiltrated by an eco-terrorist group called Avalanche. Led by a man with a gun prosthetic for an arm named Barrett, he beckons to the swordsman mercenary named Cloud hired for this assault on Mako Reactor 1 as Cloud handles the security guards to cover for the other members of the group named Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse. They comment how Cloud is a former soldier. The super soldier is created and owned by Shinra as Barrett presses Cloud for more information regarding Shinra, but Cloud hesitates as he is struck by a piercing headache while recalling specific details. To the side, Jesse is more curious about Cloud himself and his relationship with childhood friend Tifa. However, the party is unaware that their actions are being observed by Heidegger, a Shinra executive and head of public security, as he reports this incursion directly to President Shinra himself. Avalanche is already known to the company as the organization recently made an attempt on the president's life, while at the same time, Barrett tells an uninterested cloud how the Mako reactors are directly depleting the planet's energy that sustains all life, which will doom them all. Cloud claims to have been a soldier first class as he sets up the bomb to blow up the reactor, though after another pain in his head he is shocked to see a strange black feather fall before him. After dealing with a dangerous scorpion sentinel, they escape the ticking time bomb as Cloud saves Jesse's life, though it does minimal damage to the reactor itself. Seeing this, President Shinra approves sabotaging Avalanche's sabotage by triggering the facility to self-destruct, causing large collateral damage to the nearby city area. Reconvening, the group is safe, though Jesse is confused how and why the bomb did way more damage than it was supposed to. Emerging in the streets of Sector 8, they see a lot of innocent people get caught up in the wake of the explosion as they are in disbelief at the unintended disaster they caused. Undeterred, Barrett says this is just the first reactor and insists the planet won't be safe until they destroy them all, stating some sacrifices have to be made. For now, he encourages them as they return home to rest as Jesse thanks Cloud for her rescue earlier and Cloud avoids the collapsing wreckage around them. A burst of flames triggers a memory within him where he finds himself in a burning village as a man in black with a long sword turns to face him among the flames. Brought back to reality, Cloud is shocked to see the man before him and Cloud cannot believe his eyes yet feels compelled to follow him. Cloud calls out to the man he recognizes as Sephiroth, stating he's dead as Cloud killed him, but Sephiroth shrugs, wondering if he's so sure. He shows Cloud a vision of his hometown burning, adding that the planet is slowly dying, and should it die, so many things would be lost, including that which binds the two of them together, which he does not wish to happen. Because of this, he asks Cloud to simply run away to ensure that he lives, but not hearing any of this, Cloud slams down his sword, dispelling the illusion. Chuckling, Sephiroth's voice continues to haunt him, telling him to hold on to that hatred. Calming down, Cloud passes through Loveless Street, seeing more injured and displaced citizens. He then spots a flower peddler swatting away something erratically as he sees Sephiroth touch past her, claiming the soldier is too weak to save anyone, including himself. He snaps out of it when the girl calls out to him, thanking him for scaring the things away from her and giving him a flower in return. Suddenly, she begins swatting away at more things and grabbing Cloud's arm in a panic, he now sees what she sees being strange dark ghosts that surround her and chase her away while more Shinra soldiers close in on Cloud. Strangely, they don't see the ghosts, as Cloud breaks away but is soon surrounded again. One of the guards pauses and recognizes Cloud, but before he can do anything, Cloud leaps onto a passing train and escapes, which happens to be the exact train he was to rendezvous with the others in. While the others are glad to see he made it, they are puzzled when he asks them if they ever saw an invisible robed enemy before, noting he only saw them after the flower peddler grabbed him. For now, they attempt to blend into the crowd on the train, as Jesse still finds the explosion awfully suspicious. The people around them are scared and confused, wondering if rival nation Wutai is to blame, but one Shinra middle manager says they already learned Avalanche is to blame. Barrett aggressively defends the name of Avalanche, claiming they are out to save the world, but the manager counters that violence and intimidation is not the way, supporting that cooperation towards peace and prosperity will change the world. Barrett scoffs, but the manager says it is what they believe, wanting to follow his conscience before moving away. Arriving in the Sector 7 Undercity, Cloud sees some residents there also don't support Avalanche's eco-friendly mission, instead glad to support the progress and innovation Shinra consistently produces. Though, he flinches before a realistic vision of a section of the plate exploding and falling onto him, and sees more of the ghosts from before. Shaking it off, he returns to 7th Heaven, a bar in the Sector 7 slums where Tifa and Barrett's daughter Marlene are waiting for them. Tifa is surprised to see a real flower, much less one on Cloud, and he gives it to her as a gift, saying he's changed over the last five years, a response that confuses her. 
Moving on, she guides him to the apartments she lives at, where the landlady can give him free board for being part of their cause as she smooths over the process of paying Cloud for his work. As he tries to sleep, Cloud is woken up by the pained moans of his neighbor next door. Investigating, Cloud is caught off guard by Sephiroth tackling him down, and as he is grabbed, Cloud sees visions of several men in black robes all wandering in the same direction, muttering the word reunion. Panicking, Cloud is about to strike Sephiroth until he looks again and sees one of the robed men in the vision, as Tifa arrives to explain the man is Marco, and while he is sick, is not a bad guy while Cloud spots the number 49 tattooed on him. The next day, Cloud accompanies Tifa with odd jobs around the slums, passing by his landlady Marl and helping a young man named Chadley doing materia and VR research. They also spot Shinra's security arresting a brash man named Johnny for suspicion of association with the avalanche attack, and Tifa admits he does know some things and is unfortunately a talker. They overhear him claim Jesse stole Johnny's ID in order to steal parts for her bomb, and though they rescue him from Shinra, Tifa stops Cloud from silencing him, instead telling Johnny to leave town for now. Returning to the bar, Barrett gathers the group to plan the next operation as Jesse notes that though Tifa will be joining them, she can see the martial artist's heart is not into it as she does not approve of the bombings. Asking her about it, Tifa admits it's true, not believing the ends justify the means, as Barrett returns telling Cloud he won't be needed for the next mission. The soldier takes his leave after getting his pay, bumping into hoodlums from Walmart and looking for Barrett, and punishing them for barking up the wrong tree for information. Later, Jesse hires Cloud for a personal mission as Biggs and Wedge join her on a trip topside to see her parents, though they contend with aggressive highway patrol along the way. Surprisingly, they catch the attention of a speed demon soldier named Roche who is thrilled to engage in a high-speed duel against a worthy rival. He takes his loss against Cloud well, wishing to rematch again someday, as Jesse plans a kiss on him for a job well done, though she still blames herself for the reactor incident. Arriving at the Sector 7 housing district for Shinra employees, Jesse and the group distract her mother as she tells Cloud to sneak around and steal her dad's employee ID. Doing so, Cloud sees her father is bedridden after a Mako storage incident, and Jesse once was a starring actress at the Golden Saucer Park. After leaving, Biggs explains Jesse followed her passion for acting until her father's accident prompted her to give that up and study planetology. This led her to Avalanche and a theory that her father's spirit is stuck somewhere between his body and the heart of the planet. Biggs repeats his disgust at Shinra turning raw life essence into a non-renewable fuel for cheap energy, as they arrive at the Shinra warehouse they intend to rob for supplies, seeing someone else beat them here and already defeated the security. Klaus sees something that reminds him of his promise long ago to Tifa before he left their small town, to become a top-tier soldier like the war hero Sephiroth and, should she ever be in trouble, to come save her. He remembers his promise, as the time comes for them to create a distraction for Shinra's security. Wedge takes one for the team as the noise attracts Roche who is eager for a duel with Blades this time, and though he loses again, he is so satisfied he clears the way out for them as thanks. Security tries to lock them in as Wedge takes another hit for them, but they are all saved in time by the main branch of Avalanche who sweeps the area and secures their escape. Biggs mentioned Barrett's group is just a splinter cell deemed too radical in their extremist methods, and so their groups don't think highly of each other, but he still appreciates the help today, adding he heard the main group formed a partnership with Wutai in exchange for all of Midgar's materia. Using parachutes to return to the lower sector, they safely escape as Cloud begins to warm up to them, but only just a little, as he gives some supportive words to Wedge, and in return, Wedge warns Cloud not to fall for Jesse's aggressive flirtations with him, as it's all an act. Cloud also sees Wedge takes care of the neighborhood cats while Biggs over worries about his teammates, and Tifa observes and approves of this shift in personality in Cloud, even as he remembers his promise to her. As he rests, more specters hover around him as a voice wishes him sweet dreams, and the next morning Tifa wakes him up to reveal countless specters are swarming the slums, and this time everyone can see them. The specters do their best to obstruct and push back Cloud, and though slashing them down does little to stem the flood, they suddenly leave just as quickly and mysteriously as they came just after Jesse twists her ankle. Barrett takes Jesse off the next mission and assigns Wedge to look after her, turning to hire Cloud for the strike against Mako Reactor 5 after all. Preparing, Barrett says there ain't no getting off of this train as they have already issued a bomb threat and need to follow through, as they board the train back into the city where Shinra has increased its security. Barrett runs into the same middle manager who denounces Avalanche's public threats, but they are interrupted by a scan detecting the party's fake IDs, as drones crash in to contain the situation. Tifa evacuates everyone to the next car, as the middle manager suspects their avalanche and wonders why she is helping the enemy, to which she replies she doesn't want anyone to die on either side. Agreeing with her resolve, the middle manager looks after the other passengers, as Tifa turns to join the fight. Seeing a need to now get off of this train, they pull the brakes and jump off as Cloud protects Tifa, and the group continues forward on foot. 
They are unaware Heidegger is watching and guiding their every move as he states the Wu-Tai conflict was a lesson in the necessity of crushing your enemy instead of giving them mercy and expecting retaliation. Meanwhile, the group follows a route to a secret passageway laid out for them through hidden directions via graffiti of Shinra's mascot and helpful hound named Stamp. Crushing a crab warden in their way, they rendezvous with Biggs who hands them grapple guns to ease their way into Reactor 5, noting a prototype weapon as they enter. After they plant their bomb, they see the route close behind them as a hologram of Heidegger pops up, revealing their intrusion and bomb threat has been broadcast on the news and reveals public outrage that opposes Avalanche's campaign of violence. He also reveals the mostly operational Airbuster prototype will deal with them, and Barrett suggests they destroy the mech on air in defiance as the group continues to sabotage the preparations of the weapon. Walking out, they are halted by a giant hologram of President Shinra this time, who recognizes Cloud as a soldier based on his eyes, and warns him he's not long for this world one way or another, as accelerated cellular degradation is the most common cause of death for soldiers. Barrett takes this time to expose Shinra for draining the planet of Mako, and more importantly the lifestream. Chuckling, President Shin replies that people already know what Mako is, but because it produces so many comforts and conveniences, people are fine with turning a blind eye to Shinra's consumption of it. He reveals the actions of Avalanche and League with Wutai, along with Barrett's actions here, have only stoked the fire of patriotism in people, and opposing both and instead aligning with Shinra. A chortling hologram of Heidegger now appears, revealing Barrett and his group were always pawns since the beginning, showing them the tampering of their recent bomb, and thanks them for selling war to the people. Tifa's outrage triggers a memory within Cloud of a time a few years ago when he failed Tifa, before they worked together to destroy the Airbuster together. Unfortunately, its destruction causes an explosion that destroys the catwalk they're on and separates Cloud from Tifa and Barrett. Cloud tells him to go on ahead and assures them he'll be fine, and Barrett admits he was wrong about Cloud so far, taking a reluctant Tifa with him as Cloud tumbles down, though his grapple gun breaks as it breaks his fall. Knocked out, Cloud is surrounded by specters as he speaks to images of himself who encourage him to get up and keep moving, though he is interrupted by a vision of Sephiroth again who tells him there is still much to be done. Elsewhere, we now see a young ninja named Yuffie sneak into Midgar, boasting to be a Materia Hunter and Elite Special Forces operative for the new Wutai government, here to meet Avalanche before a mission to infiltrate Shinra HQ and steal their ultimate Materia. Making her way to the rendezvous point under a Moogle-themed cloak, she spots a strange man in black robes but sees he's not all there. She's also not at all impressed by the big city itself as she passes by more black-robed men muttering the word Genova, finding them awfully suspicious. Now waking up to someone calling out to him, Cloud wakes up in a church to the flower peddler he met earlier. Introducing herself as Aerith and repeating it so there's no misunderstandings this time, she states he came crashing down through the roof and landed on her flowers. She hands him back a materia he dropped, showing off one of her own, but Cloud remarks how materia is so common everyone and their mother has some. However, she replies that hers is special as it does nothing at all, which triggers a strange vision within Cloud of Aerith praying while her materia falls in some water. Recovering, he replies that it's more likely she just doesn't know how to use it, and she says that's fine, as it's more precious to her as a gift from her mother. Their chat is interrupted as a dark-suited man with red hair named Reno walks in with Shinra troops, wondering who Cloud is. Quickly, Aerith claims he's a soldier and her bodyguard, asking for his agreement on this and hiring him for the price of one date. Reno sees Cloud has the eyes, but when he asks his rank and Cloud replies first, the Turk laughs loudly at the obvious lie, adding that his job is to protect Aerith too. Reno's agility and strength puts pressure on Cloud who wins their duel and goes in for a killing blow. However, Aerith calls out to him to stop as Spectre suddenly appear before them and haul them both into the next room. Aerith notes they're not attacking this time, and they even save her life from an accident. Reno orders his men not to fire at Aerith, though the Spectres stand by observing, allowing Cloud to drop chandeliers on the guards and enabling them to escape. In the clear, Cloud is curious why one of Shinra's elite agents, called the Turks, has business with her, but she evades the question as she leads him to the train station. Arriving, the citizens are still upset to see the reactor on fire as the trains are suspended and another Turk enters the scene, so the duo decide to keep a low profile while Aerith insists they go to her house. At the same time, Yuffie sees a news report on the Mako 5 reactor, where the director of Shinra's advanced weaponry division, Scarlet, reassures the public that things are under control and those responsible will be stopped before they strike again. The ninja thinks this to be Avalanche's work as she meets her contact Zhijia and passes by some random people in red bandanas. She is soon introduced to the other members of Avalanche, Billy Bob, Polk, and Nayo, and learns her partner Sonan is already here in town. Waiting for him and the fake IDs they need to get topside, Yuffie is introduced to the popular real-time strategy game Fort Condor, finding many in Midgar, like Roche and a certain Shinra middle manager, are quite adept at it. 
Returning to base, her partner for this operation, Sonan, introduces himself, commenting how he's trained under Yuffie's father and mentions how Yuffie will be taking point for the mission. Nayo then takes them to retrieve their IDs, explaining Midgar was built by Shinra for Shinra, but at its heart, it's full of people who view Midgar as their home while viewing Shinra itself as the enemy. She points out Barrett and Tifa as members of the Splinter Cell that split off from the main group over policy dispute, as Yuffie overhears they were responsible for the reactor attack but lost someone named Cloud. Barrett believes he survived the fall, but Biggs urges him to keep a low profile as Don Corneo of Wall Market still has men searching for him, and Tifa offers to look into this. Nayo insists they be left to their own devices, disapproving of their lack of concern for collateral damage and their violent approach to opposing Shinra, elaborating that they all wish to fight Shinra but not at the cost of leveling Midgar or involving innocent lives. Yuffie points out Wu Taiyans don't see the difference since Shinra leveled their home and Nayo hopes this alliance will help foster better relations. They run into Corneo's goons, who try to aggressively recruit Nayo to be Corneo's next bride, and after being beaten down, leave after hearing Tifa has volunteered to go with them. Yuffie then points to a robed man, asking what's up with them, and Nayo replies they are victims of Mako poisoning by Shinra for not making the grade as a soldier candidate. Catching wind of Zhija in trouble, they defeat a giant centipede mech with a dynamic entry from Yuffie, alongside flawless synchronized support from Sonon, as the contact tells them any material they're seeking will be likely in the advanced weaponry lab. He also mentions he learned Shinra has something big planned for the destruction of Sector 7, but it doesn't involve them, as they take the last train out to the topside. Back with Cloud and Aerith, they cut through a junkyard to enter the Central District in time to see a news report on the Mako 5 reactor. Cloud sees Aerith is well known in her small town and even helps the orphanage, as she lives in a well-kept and secluded house surrounded by relatively clean water and lush greenery. She introduces him to her mother Elmira and says she'll be fine now so Cloud can go back to Sector 7, and Elmira suggests they do so in the morning. In the meanwhile, Aerith has Cloud help her with jobs around town and rescue some kids in trouble, which triggers another memory of Tifa when she was a kid. Aerith guesses Tifa must be someone special for Cloud, but they are interrupted by another weak man in black robes, this time with a number 2 tattooed on him. The man grabs Cloud and suddenly appears as Sephiroth, claiming their reunion is nothing to fear, before wandering off again. Cloud asks Aerith if she knows who Sephiroth is, and she recognizes the name as the war hero who died 5 years ago, but Cloud suspects he may actually be alive, and she slowly agrees. Moving on, they encounter the curious Moogle shop and are intercepted by the Turk from earlier named Rude. Aerith insists Rude isn't a bad person and Rude agrees, but still has a job to do, attacking Cloud and showing he's no pushover. After expending a few sunglasses, Rude is about to get serious when he gets a call from Reno saying they are both to report to Sector 7 immediately and so he takes his leave. Returning home, Amaya recognizes Cloud as a soldier, commenting they can never live a normal life and demands he leave on his own tonight. At the same time, Sona sees Yuffie easily gets motion sickness on the train as he is reminded of his sister Melfi who suffered the same way. She was also trained alongside him, and near the end of the war she sacrificed herself to save a crowd from a Shinra mech gone haywire, something that still haunts him to this day. Over with Cloud, that night he remembers his own mother urging him to settle down with a nice girl, and agreeing with Elmira leaves that night as she tells him to just cut through Sector 6 to get to 7. As it so happens, Aerith was wise to his action and took a shortcut to meet him on the way there, still having fun with him and leads the way forward, as Cloud is suddenly struck by another mental pain that causes him to tear up when he looks at Aerith for some reason. Passing through the rubble, Cloud notes how they can see the sky here and Aerith explains they are currently reconstructing a new plate ever since the previous one fell. All the laborers needed a place to relax and blow off some steam and so came about the entertainment district of Sector 6 called the Wall Market. The amount of money to be made attracted seedy people and practices, and rather than handle it, the government decided to simply wall it off, hence the name. For now, she takes them through a detour that doesn't pass through wall markets, staying upbeat to an infectious level that even starts to rub off on Cloud. Arriving at Sector 7, they take a break as Aerith mentions Cloud is the same soldier rank as the first boy she ever loved, named Zack, though this triggers another mental pain for Cloud. Suddenly, the door between sectors opens up and Cloud spots Tifa in a chocobo carriage and she explains she's on her way to see Don Corneo. She assures him she'll be fine, but Aerith insists they go after her, warning him they are underestimating Corneo. Following them all the way back to Wall Market, they ask a chocobo handler Sam where Tifa went and he assures him she'll be picked as Corneo's next wife candidate, which likely means she'll never see the light of day again. Marching to Corneo's mansion, they are turned away by a man named Leslie who tries to discourage them, but as they insist, he says candidates for the next audition must be approved by either Chocobo Sam, Madam M, or Andrea Rodea. Johnny overhears this, over-eager to rescue Tifa, and runs off as the pair find the Honeybee Inn's Andrea Rodea far too elusive and Chocobo Sam already recommended Tifa. 
Madam M seems more interested in Cloud than Aerith, but agrees to help after delivering an intense hand massage and having them fight as her champions at an underground tournament. Clearing the first few rounds easily enough, the pair gain the favor of the crowd in Corneo's trio and edge out a win against the Dawn's own champion fighter, the bizarre but deadly Hellhouse. They put on such an entertaining show that even Andrea Rodea takes interest, and Madam M openly appreciates how Cloud and Aerith have helped Sector 5, promising a spectacular dress for Aerith as a reward. As they make preparations, Cloud kills time by working out at the gym with a trainer named Jules, helping the Guardian Angel of the Slums, and handling Sheer's counterattack of a mech that moves three times normal speed. He is impressed by how Aerith cleans up thanks to Madam M, and she passes along that Andrea Rodea wishes to meet Cloud, adding that Cloud can disguise himself as a girl to sneak into the mansion with her. Entering the Honey Bee Inn, Cloud observes the other patrons for research purposes, as he is told to practice his dancing before meeting Andrea. As he is treated to the premiere stage show, Cloud is greeted by Andrea directly before being volunteered to dance alongside him. Going with the flow, Cloud impresses Andrea, and in return he is transformed while gaining sponsorship. Entering the mansion, they are brought to Tifa, who is both shocked and impressed by Cloud's disguise, and she meets Aerith and explains she's here to learn why Corneo's men were searching for Avalanche. Being brought before the dawn, Cloud is chosen as the next bride as Tifa and Aerith escape from being leftovers, and Leslie reveals he works for Andrea while helping them out. Confronting the Dawn, he explains he was told by Shinra to find Barrett, and with a chuckle, states that Shinra will blow up the Sector 7 pillar, dropping the plate and crushing everyone alongside Avalanche. Before they leave, Don Corneo drops the group then and there into the sewers, while at the same time, director Reef 2 Esti begs President Shinra to consider the over 50,000 lives he's about to lose, but his plea falls on deaf ears. Back with Yuffie, your fake IDs get them inside the building easily enough, though they happen to board an elevator alongside Scarlet, who quickly identifies them as Wu Tai spies and deliberately drops some inflammatory comments, though Yuffie manages to keep her cool. However, Scarlet immediately traps them when they try to follow her, intending to use them as live test subjects for her newest weapons. Sonon is furious as it was Scarlet's mechs who killed Melfi, and it's Yuffie who keeps him focused on the mission. As Scarlet observes them passing her tests, she notes they are very skilled ninjas, and intrigued wishes to personally welcome them with her own weapon. She can also hardly believe they seem to be after Materia, as she guides them to a heavy weapons testing arena and personally pilots her Crimson Nair to challenge them. Though the ninja duo defeat her, Scarlet is more interested in using this experience to update her research and improve on the model, activating a distress beacon before she is captured. At this time, the elite secret military of Shinra, Deep Ground, is alerted as one of its powerful commanders, Nero, is awakened and released. He is greeted by his brother Vice, leader of Deep Ground and the Sviets, who is currently being scanned into a virtual reality simulator as part of a digital replication project under Hojo and facilitated by Chadley. Meanwhile, Scarlet admits that while she is working on a powerful new materia, her research is far from complete. She then openly admits Shinra is going to drop the Sector 7 plate on the slums and blame it on Avalanche and Wutai, but Yuffie isn't sure what the significance of all that is. Suddenly, Deep Ground forces surround and attack the pair as Nero appears and uses his darkness to attack friend and foe alike. Scarlet orders him to take care of the intruders while this too is being recorded for research, though during the fight, Nero breaks free of Shinra's control and containment of him, destroying his bonds and killing the researchers as well. Yuffie and Sonon are pushed to their limit trying to fend off Nero, and though it seems they win, Sonon catches Nero trying to assassinate Yuffie with a sneak attack. Thinking of Melfi, he pushes her to safety while sacrificing himself, as Nero kills him and claims him with his darkness, though Sonon is relieved to be reunited with his sister again. Back with Cloud and the group, they deal with a giant sewer monster, and think to use the sewers to quickly reach Sector 7 and warn everyone, in case Corneo was telling the truth. Not wanting to see a repeat of the Sector 6 disaster, Tifa is reluctant to accept Shinra would really go through with it, but just in case, feels they have to stop it. She notices Aerith seems distant when agreeing, suspecting she knows something, and Aerith simply replies she always tells herself the future isn't written in stone. Fending off fierce Sahagin, they are forced topside, emerging in the old Sector 7 train yard as they spot the Turks fly overhead on their way to the support pillar. Tifa shares rumors of this abandoned station being haunted, and they indeed see something strange in the neighborhood as they encounter ghosts both friendly and not. Tifa looks upon one and sees Marlene, reminded of a ghost story she heard of a black wind that captures children in the train yard, seeing the ghost disappear and said black wind impeding her progress nearby. They also intercept a message from Reno and Rude confirming the plate dropping mission while fighting local resistance and Tifa is stunned. Cloud and Aerith try to keep her focused on preventing it in time, though a phantom steals away Aerith, forcing her to see a painfully lonely memory from her childhood. Exercising the evil spirit in their way, they pause as they see the grateful ghosts of captured children finally freed and passing on. 
hurrying to catch up to see Avalanche exchanging fire with Shinra in a losing battle, but a group of Spectres now emerge to bar their path, stalling them to prevent them from helping in time. By the time they arrive, the Avalanche forces are nearly wiped out as they see Wedge take a bad fall and Biggs gunned down by security. Tifa moves to back them up as she asks Aerith to go to her bar and get Marlene to safety, and Wedge manages to convince some of the Shinra soldiers to allow the citizens to evacuate. Aerith passes along the news of the plate dropping to Marl, who organizes the panicking crowd, as she narrowly avoids death from a Shinra helicopter crash and is spotted by Song, leader of the Turks. She collects Marlene as Song comes to collect her, though she insists on ensuring the little girl's safety first, and Song allows it. Meanwhile, Reed deliberately avoids shooting Tifa, as they discover Jesse crushed by debris and are too late to stop Reno from starting the plate separation sequence. Clashing with the two Turks, the group is obstructed by the Spectres on actually overriding the self-destruct sequence as Reno and Rook complete their mission and get away. The group gets a transmission from Song who says they came into contact with the Ancient, who is now in their custody, as Aerith interjects that she found Marlene and urges them to run. Scrambling, Barrett finds a zipline down from the pillar, and as the group takes it down just in time, President Shinra watches the collapse from his office as a strange caped cat doll looks on in despair as well. Escaping the Shinra building, Yuffie mourns Sonan, blaming him for thinking of her like his sister and is horrified to see the mass destruction wrought by Shinra. Meanwhile, surviving the disaster, Cloud and Tifa look on at Barrett, devastated over the loss of his team, but more importantly his daughter Marlene, denying Tifa's words that they have some responsibility for this outcome. Through his grief and rage, he points out no matter what came before, Shinra is the one who made this outrageous choice. Trembling herself, Tifa agrees as he tells her not to forget her anger, and Cloud tells Barrett Marlene is alive and well, as Aerith likely took her to her house in Sector 5. As they hold on to this hope, Cloud asks about the Ancients that were mentioned, and Barrett shares they were the original stewards of the planet, able to commune and talk to it. Cloud is suddenly hit by another pain and vision of Sephiroth, who reveals he also has the blood of the Ancients within him, and thus the planet is his birthright. Sephiroth also comments how Cloud has failed again, but from the outside, Tifa doesn't see Cloud talking to anyone, as Sephiroth adds he'll grow stronger through this suffering. Cutting through Wall Market, they see Shinra's security searching the compound as they speak, as Barrett is relieved to find his daughter safe with Elmira. They inform her Aerith was taken by the Turks for being an ancient, and coming clean, Elmira confirms that's true and Aerith is not her real daughter by blood. Fifteen years ago, she was waiting for her husband to return from the front lines of the war when she spotted Aerith's dying mother who requested she take her daughter somewhere safe and so decided to take her in. Even as a child, Aerith was talkative, sharing how they had escaped from a facility and her mother merely returned to the planet so she's not sad. Elmira didn't believe her until one day Aerith heard Elmira's husband say goodbye after dying and shared it days before Elmira got the official notice herself. Before long, the Turks would find Aerith, telling her as an ancient she would guide them to the Promised Land with her boundless knowledge and wisdom. And so, because Shinra sincerely believes this tale, she believes that even with Aerith in their grasp, they will take care of her and treat her like a guest until they get what they want. So, she asks them not to do anything rash and endanger her, and Tifa agrees, thinking it may be better to wait and see. Agreeing for now, they head back to Sector 7 to check on things, running into some of the surviving evacuees and helping with the search and rescue. They spot one of Wedge's cats and follow it into a strange tunnel that has opened up after the collapse and find him alive but unconscious inside a strange facility. A tremor separates the group as Barrett and Tifa discover this is actually a hidden Shinra research facility and deal with many of the cage experiments that have broken free. Putting down hordes of humanoid failed experiments, they are horrified to see Shinra really was using people as live test subjects right under their feet and this triggers a memory and cloud of a similar experience. However, they are interrupted from exploring further as Spectres surround them and bring them all outside, including Wedge and his cat. Barrett wonders if Jesse and Biggs made it, but Cloud says he saw them in their last moments, and Tifa offers comfort that they at least return to the planet. Taking Wedge to rest at Elmira's, Cloud brings up they found proof that Shinra is continuing its unethical human experimentation, and knows firsthand that as long as the heartless head scientist Hojo is still around, Aerith is not safe with Shinra. That night, Cloud and his allies are restless, as he sees Barrett outside, finally remembering the other members of his avalanche cell and grateful for each of them. Later, Cloud spots Tifa, who figures the flower he gave her earlier was from Aerith, and tells him in the language of flowers it means reunion. Breaking down, she begins crying over losing her home again, and Cloud embraces her, telling her it's okay to let it out, and she thanks him before turning in. As he rests, Cloud thinks he sees Aerith and concludes this is a dream, as she tells him she used to live in the Shinra building when she was little. Cloud admits he's worried about her like the others, but Aerith turns to him, saying no matter what, he cannot fall in love with her because even if he thinks he has, it's not real. Reaching out for her illusion, he declares he's going to come rescue her and she thanks him as he wakes up. 
The next morning, Cloud says he felt Aerith calling out to him and the group resolves to rescue Aerith now, though now they hear the ruination of Sector 7 is being blamed on Avalanche too. A troublemaker named Curie also spreads the rumor from Topside that Wutai is funding Avalanche and the terrorists are serving foreign interests, which infuriates Barrett. Seeking away Topside, they think to talk to Corneo again, though they run into Leslie who offers to help them instead. However, he asks for their help in hunting down the Dawn first, revealing that Dawn once chose Leslie's fiance as his next bride and she was never seen again. However, Leslie botches his revenge as the Dawn spills that Shinra traced the leak about the plate dropping, which allowed people time to escape back to him and so he fled into hiding. Furthermore, he reveals that the reason Shinra was willing to even do it was because they planned to abandon Midgar and build something close to paradise. The group saves Leslie from being executed but the Dawn's monster saves him and allows him to escape. Unable to give chase for now, Leslie helps the group up and over the wall, handing them high power grappling guns as the group climbs onward and upward. Fighting Shinra's aerial forces along the way, the group pauses to take in the scale of the Sector 7 destruction before finally facing down Shinra HQ. They notice the tight security, wondering if it's in response to recent actions by Wu Tai, though after sneaking in, see there is hardly anyone around in the lower floors. Tifa attempts to disable security to get to the 65th floor where Hojo's lab is, but finds security drops on its own mysteriously. However, their clearance will only get them to the 59th floor via the elevator of stairs. They think the stairs will be a longer but quieter way up, but thinking on the endeavor again, they decide it would probably suck and be too much effort, and so opt to take the elevator. On the way up, they do run into some security, but also normal people here just working a job with normal worries and families. Tifa sympathizes, but Barrett decides to be judgmental, claiming even good people who work for a bad company are guilty by association. At the same time, Scarlet is overseeing the development of a new materia as the group's tracks are being covered up without them knowing. The same man behind it also observes Director Tuesti, noting he openly disagrees with Shinra's extreme actions. Back with the group, they pass through various exhibits and a museum detailing the president, the company he built, and the directors and what they contribute. The tour ends with a cutting-edge virtual reality presentation where they are told that thousands of years ago, the planet was home to a people now called the Ancients who were able to harness the energy of the planet and bend it to their will, resulting in materia. They also spoke of a promised land full of resources, but their civilization ended when they were struck by a meteor 2,000 years ago. As soon as the video ends, the group is suddenly sent into another one, but this one shows Midgar being torn apart by a falling meteor as well. Among the Annihilation, Cloud sees a black-robed man turn into Sephiroth and cut down Tifa, but this is also part of the illusion. At the same time, Director Palmer is shocked to see Sephiroth pass by him in the building, as the group wonders what that horrible future with the meteor was all about. Exiting, they are summoned personally by Mayor Domino by his assistant, as the mayor reveals he's been the person concealing their infiltration, cutting the alarm, and smoothing over the personnel they have encountered. He explains he is Avalanche's inside man, though Barrett's cell wasn't informed, and he's fine with helping him to get to Hojo's lab as long as it hurts Shinra. He's frustrated being the mayor, and yet is completely powerless, forgotten, and a puppet for Shinra. Over with Hojo, he questions Aerith on the Promised Land, but she gives him the silent treatment, as he tells her her mother Athalna was the last pure-blooded ancient, informing her they collected and harvested her for specimen samples after she died from her escape attempt as her biology continues to impress him. He is called away to a director meeting, as over with the group, Tifa continues to point out the average Shimra employee is a normal white-collar worker, as they meet with another mole working under the mayor who informs them of the director meeting. Leaving it at that, Cloud is shocked to run into the Shinra security officer who recognized him from earlier, remembering him from basic training. He's glad to see Cloud survived after word spread he died alongside others, and says he'll get their mutual soldier friend, Kunsul. Another headache hits Cloud as Tifa notices, but he shrugs it off and quickly moves on as they spot President Shinra asking Heidegger for an update on their spreading of the avalanche Wutai Alliance conspiracy theory. Crawling into the ducks, they see many of the employees are still distraught by the plate dropping, and Director Tuesti is working overtime to plan out rebuilding the sector and city. Spying on the executive meeting, Palmer is still spooked as he claims to have seen Sephiroth walking the halls, and dismissing that, President Shinra also dismisses Reeve's plan for reconstruction. He elaborates that with the Ancient in their custody, the Neo Midgar project will commence where they will build a new metropolis in the Promised Land. To this end, he gives Hojo full permission to force cooperation out of Aerith for their means. The Professor points out they can also mitigate the risk of their one specimen by breeding her, and suggests candidates from both the S and G-type soldiers. After the meeting, the group closely follows Hojo into his lab, holding him at gunpoint to release Aerith, but the Professor reverses the situation by releasing lab mutants on the group and escaping in the chaos while a strange beast looks on. 
They find Aerith, and while Hojo intends to collect as much combat data from the group as possible, he notices Cloud and suddenly recognizes him, exposing he is not actually a soldier. He is about to explain everything before Spectre suddenly appear, rush down the scientist, and carry him away. Quickly, Barrett frees Aerith, thanking her for saving Marlene, as the creature is freed too and tries but fails to stop Hojo before he escapes. Placing her hand on its head, Aerith communicates with the creature, assuring the group it's a friend, as the group is surprised to find it can talk. He declines to share his real name, instead going by the designation Hojo assigned him of Red 13, but Cloud is more in a trance at sensing something ahead, uttering the name Genova and calling it Mother before collapsing. Meanwhile, Reno and Rue don't agree with the plate dropping, as Song says to think of it as a balancing of the scales, as after everything humans have taken from the planet, they have now paid some of it back to the livestream. The next thing he knows, Cloud wakes up in Aerith's old room where she explains she is a descendant of the Ancients, though their real name is the Cetra, and confesses she has no idea how to guide anyone to the Promised Land. They are interrupted by the Spectres circling them again, and Red 13 explains they are called Whispers and are Arbiters of Fate who appear before those who try and change their destiny and stop them from altering a set course. Tifa wonders if that means all of their lives are somehow fixed, and Red 13 affirms this by the will of the planet from the moment any of them are born until death. Barrett is skeptical and wonders how he could possibly know that, to which Red 13 replies that when Aerith touched him, he found this knowledge of the Whispers. Aerith adds Shinra is part of the problem, but they aren't the real enemy, as there is a much bigger threat, though every time a Whisper touches her, she loses a part of herself and feels lost as if in a maze. Suddenly, they get a message from the Mayor, who is joined by Wedge to say that Main Avalanche HQ is now attacking the Shinra HQ building to try and flush out the President. Though the building is on high alert now, there is a path to the roof where an avalanche chopper will come and extract them. Red 13 joins those who fight further as Cloud is distracted by an out-of-place black feather, and the group finds themselves directly before a being Aerith announces to be Genova. Under more pain, Cloud now sees Sephiroth descending before them, blending with a memory of years ago when Sephiroth declared he would claim the world together with his mother Genova. He also sees a younger Tifa grieving over her dead father and picking up Sephiroth's sword in anger. As Tifa now tries to calm Cloud, when she touches him, she now sees what he sees of Sephiroth before them. Unsure if what is before him is real, Cloud charges ahead as Sephiroth cuts the bridge they're on, clashing blades with Cloud and noting a touching reunion before easily knocking Cloud aside. Looking on, Hojo is ecstatic to see the reunion hypothesis proven true as he throws more experiments in the way of the group while staying one step ahead of them. They see Chadley works here, though after they indulge and overcome every possible simulation, including the top secret and classified simulations like Vice, Chadley reveals he is actually a cyborg created by Hojo to assist with research that was made with no free will. However, with data provided by Cloud and the others, he has figured out a way to become free from Hojo, thanking Cloud and turning to Lee for a new, uncertain future. After collecting enough data, he sees Sephiroth walking away Genova's body and decides to release the party as they see a trail of malicious energy headed toward the President's office. Entering the massive office, the group spots President Shinra dangling from the side of the building outside, and while Barrett says he would love to drop him, he rescues the President anyway in exchange for him publicly confessing to being behind the plate drop and killing thousands, as well as clear the name of Avalanche. Smirking, Shinra pulls a gun on Barrett, mocking him for his short-sighted idealisms, and telling him how turning the public against Shinra will cause more harm than good on a global socio-economic scale. However, President Shinra is cut short as a long blade pierces right through him, dying instantly to Sephiroth hidden right behind him. Barrett now charges Sephiroth as whispers dash into the room, and before anyone could react, the elite soldier quickly runs Barrett through as well, leaving him to die, as he turns to face the party and reveal his true form as a piece of Genova. Trapping them all in an illusion, the monstrous abomination falls in a fight with the group, as upon defeat, it reveals the true host underneath it all, the robe man with the 49 tattoo that was Cloud's neighbor, Marco. Seeing the body of Genova nearby, they move to secure it, but another Sephiroth now steps in to claim it before flying off. Before they can give chase, a whisper leaves from within Barrett, resuscitating him, as Red 13 explains it simply wasn't his preordained time to die, and Barrett thanks the whisper for the plot armor. Though, as Cloud tries to catch this new Sephiroth, the Whispers block him as he sees this is yet another robed man underneath, and is the same one he encountered in Sector 5 as he gets away. Now seeing their rescue chopper arrive, they watch as the chopper is shot down by the Turks who drop off the former Vice President, Rufus Shinra. Cloud buys the group time to escape, though Rufus shows he has no pushover himself, as the soldier disarms and fends off the young executive. At the same time, Aerith, Barrett, and Red 13 find the next service elevator has a killer mech gunning for them, and Wedge is forced out of the building by the Whispers. 
Though they defeat the Arsenal, they are still caught by Heidegger in the lobby until Cloud barrels in on a motorcycle to rescue them just in time. Tifa pulls up in a truck and together they break through, out of the building, and onto the adjacent highway. As they drive off, they see countless whispers envelop the Shinra building, and inside, Rufus is unclear on what they are, but remains focused on bringing the group in regardless. Fending off Shinra's security down the entire expressway, they take down another mech as Cloud breaks upon seeing another vision of Sephiroth. Aerith declares Sephiroth is wrong, but he counters as she simply cannot see clearly, adding everyone is bound to this world, and if it becomes unmade, so too shall they. He directs their attention to the Whispers as they begin to flood the sky and surround the entire city, claiming that destiny comes. They now see a memory of a soldier named Zack approaching Midgar during the day while the city is engulfed by Whispers as he turns to face down hundreds of Shinra security soldiers assigned to kill him, claiming the price of freedom is steep. Snapping back to reality, they watch Sephiroth turn and cut open a portal, inviting Cloud inside, but Aerith halts Cloud, saying this will be Destiny's crossroads, thinking boundless but terrifying freedom awaits them on the other side. She adds, Sephiroth will claim he's doing this for the planet, but thinks this is not the way things are supposed to be, and he is actually the biggest threat to the planet. She insists he has to be stopped, though warns that if they succeed, they'll be changing more than fate itself, they'll also be changing themselves. Stepping through, they invite the intervention of the Whispers, who converge into a massive storm and begin tearing apart the city while sweeping away the party. A massive Whisper called the Harbinger also forms, connected to all the threads of time and space that shape the planet's fate as it tosses the party through a surreal realm and pits them against the advent children of a future timeline that fight to protect the continuity they belong to. Every clash brings to them more visions of the intended future by the planet, such as the ending of the game Final Fantasy VII and the death of Aerith, as the group rejects that destiny and defeats the Harbinger to make their own fate. Thinking they've won, a giant meteor now bursts into the scene to destroy Midgar, as this is soon swept away by Sephiroth at its center. Calling out Cloud, the two face each other down in a duel, but not alone, as Sephiroth is supported by the Whispers in fighting the group, and Aerith, Red Thirteen, Tifa, and Barret join Cloud to overcome all adversity to dispel all of the Whispers fighting to preserve this timeline. Finding himself somewhere strange, Cloud is hit by more pains in his head, though when Sephiroth grabs his wrist, the pain goes away. Sephiroth then says this is the edge of creation, and he has no intention for himself or Cloud to end here, offering they team up to defy destiny together. Cloud refuses the offer and tries to fight again, but Sephiroth easily disarms him, cryptically telling him there will be 7 seconds till the end, and that may be enough time for Cloud, depending on what he chooses to do. As the game ends, reality resumes as Rufus assumes the mantle of Shinra president, Hojo cannot help but laugh at the situation with Genova, and Zack ends up surviving his final stand, saving both himself and Cloud's life. He sees a strange dome of light now lift around Midgar as sparkles rain from the sky down on its inhabitants, and we now see Biggs wake up from being critically wounded as Jesse's gear is set beside him. Leaving the city by Chocobo, Yuffie is now determined to build a team to aid her in her mission to fight Shinra. Back with the group, Cloud declares he wants to pursue Sephiroth now, and the group is unanimous in joining him, seeing how dangerous he is firsthand. Rain begins to fall as Aerith sees two timelines at the same time, where in one, Zack carries a delirious Cloud back to Midgar, and another where Cloud strides away from Midgar on his next journey. Zack enters Midgar and heads straight to Aerith's church to see her, but is confused to see displaced homeless instead. Meanwhile, the party hitchhikes a ride from a man named Chocobo Bill and is dropped off outside the nearby town of Calm as their unknown journey continues. Final Fantasy VII Remake has enjoyed the success of selling over 5.5 million copies worldwide. Okay, everyone has a take on this game, so tell me yours in the comments below. If you enjoyed the recap, then leave a like and a big thanks to the patron and channel member soldiers. Links are in the description for how to support the channel and get extra videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next Battlefield.